the next speaker, um, I actually found uh, she was uh, teaching a winter course at Princeton. And I got the email saying, oh, there's a class on the tidyverse. And I'm like, hey, hey, what's your research in? So it's some cool stuff that, her, that where she works and invited her to come speak at this conference in very short notice. And she said, yes, we're all thankful for her turning around such a quick, such a quick turnaround. And English is technically her third language in order of learning. Everyone, please welcome to the stage, Boriana. Hello, everyone. My name is Boriana, and I work at the Office of Population Research at Princeton University. I've been using R for over 15 years now, and it's been incredible to see how the language has evolved. All right, let me tell you a little bit about DNA or genetics data. Um, a DNA looks like a twisted ladder with uh, steps, that, the ends of which are these four nitrogen uh, bases that um, have Latin names I can't really pronounce properly. But if you uncoil, um, uncoil it, you can imagine two lines running simultaneously or in parallel and with, the number, uh, with the letters A, T, C, or G with uh, a requirement that A and T uh, pair and C and G. Or in other words, if um, at a particular spot on, in one line you have an A, um, then on the corresponding spot on the other line, you can have only T or A, and the same with the C and G. And um, people refer to a spot on the genome as a locus or a SNP and refer to these bases as alleles. And if the two lines, or sometimes uh, they refer to them as strands, are numbered, the alleles could be numbered. Uh, but the uh, more interesting or uh, distinction between alleles that is made is uh, one of them is called the major allele, and the other one, uh, the minor. and that depends on which one is more prevalent in the population. So at this particular spot or locus that I have sectioned, if more people um, in, in the population have an A on either spot, uh, on either line, then A would be um, called the major allele and T would be called the minor allele. And so genetics data, sometimes could come in the form of two lines per person with these letters A, T, C, or G. But more often the way it comes is uh, in one line and at a particular spot or locus, there'll be a number of how many copies a person has of the minor allele. So um, if uh, there are T and T on both, lines, it will be two copies, of, and, and T is the minor allele, it will be two copies. In, in this case, it will be a one, one copy, or in the case of where it will be A and A, it will be zero copies. And then there will be another file called a map file that has all of these um, spots or locus enumerated, and then um, the second column that tells which is the minor allele at that particular spot. Um, so, um, so I was given a program that would generate this type of genetics uh, data and uh, a trait, and it would take about like 20 parameters, and then it would produce uh, four different files, one at the family level and three at the siblings level. And the... The, the basic um, idea was that some of these parameters didn't vary from simulation to simulation, like the total number of families, how many children each family would have, the number of SNPs or loci. And there are these other parameters that I was supposed to give to the model. It was a very complicated model. Um, the program was written by a biologist who um, took into account all, all, all kinds of theories um, that I don't know anything about, <laughs> but I was given a list of parameters um, 
then uh, I just decided that I should make 10 simulations. And of course, with all these um, random numbers being generated, I need to keep track of random seeds so I could reproduce things. So we had a total of 50,000 of families and 1,200 SNPs. That's like the gist of this slide. But then there was this other parameters that um, they're like broken into sets of two. I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail about them, but they had uh, values that had to vary. And uh, one of them had had to do with heritability, which um, people define as the proportion of variation of the trait that is explained by genes. So there were two of those parameters and they had to, we would try low, medium and high values for them. <clears throat> and then there was like two parameters for correlation between siblings of some part of the environment. And then there were two um, parameters for these um, like dominance part of the model. And um, early on, uh, it was decided that one of them would just keep at zero and not vary. But e you can calculate quickly, there's like 72 combinations. So it's not a huge number, um, but uh, something that I had to uh, work with. Okay, the analysis uh, that I had to run had a very similar flow to the simulations. So I get the simulated files, prep them, uh, make like an input file to the analysis program, and then I would get some results. And so the goal is to simulate 10 cents for each parameter combination. And um, to begin with, I said, okay, let me take one of them and just run it on a Linux server. And it took eight hours <laughs> to simulate the data and produce about 10 gigabytes of data, which is not a huge amount, but you know it adds up. And I'm like, OK, well, let's then um, run the analysis program, uh, Some one of which I wrote. Um, and that one took about two hours to run. So I thought, OK, I need to do something uh, here. But before I tell you what I decided to do, which you already know what it was, let me uh, kind of tell you what kind of analysis people run on these types of data. So the, the very first, um, and it's still being run, uh, type of analysis that people run is to discover SNPs. Uh, that means to discover SNPs that are associated with the given trait. And to do that, they run thing, uh, something called uh, genome-wide association studies, which basically is like a regression or association models that would use all available genetics data and see if any uh, SNP or locus um, has a significant association with the outcome. And um, usually the results are come plotted in something called a Manhattan plot. <laughs> and the people use a very, very stringent p-value because there's like multiple um, comparisons being made because human genome has like 2 million or I don't know, in the millions of, of these SNPs um, that are shown on the first slide. And so you can see the very few of them actually make it through the cutoff for the p-values. And that's why they call this the Manhattan plot. Um, so uh, this actually used very successfully to find um, diseases, for example, that are caused primarily by one gene, uh, something that they call Mendelian disease. But uh, people, um, after running many, many of these, and of course you need, with so many, um, SNPs uh, or like variables, columns, if you will, you need um, a good number of people or rows uh, to be able to get anywhere. Um, so, um, so yes, they um, um, people 
it came to realize there are actually a lot of traits, a lot of disease and a lot of traits, if you're interested in like social traits uh, or even height, um, biometric traits um, are actually uh, many SNPs are associated, what they call it, they're polygenic, they, they, they're kind of defined, not defined, but they're caused by many of the SNPs. Um, so nowadays, uh, people sometimes would do other types of analysis, but um, for me, I just had to run this to see if it would uh, pick up the SNPs that we, uh, by design, uh, simulated to be associated with the trait. Then another um, common type of analysis that there are lots of uh, papers written about it is estimating heritability, which I, uh, as I said, it's the proportion of the variation in the trait that is explained by the genes. So people usually employ something called uh, Gremel, which is basically genome uh, restricted maximum likelihood of, from like um, mixed models. And um, so some of these parameters that um, we gave to the uh, simulation program, we were specifying heritability and we were trying to see if we can recover because we kind of knew what it should be. So to sum things up, um, it is the same program for all the simulations and the analysis programs was the same and each simulation was independent of each other. So it was like a classic case for uh, trying to do things in parallel. And um, I realized that a lot of people probably at this conference use big data and are very used to parallel processing. So I apologize, this is nothing new. Um, is my one sentence about parallel processing, um, which is basically executing repeated tasks simultaneously on different cores or on different nodes on a cluster. So as I mentioned, I started by running things on our um, Linux server, which um, soon after I realized had some limitations. So uh, then I had to move um, the simulations to uh, high power computing settings, which um, this is my very uh, basic picture of it, which stacks um, a lot of cores or processing power in one place. But um, where on a lot of computers nowadays that come with multiple cores, I like this picture because uh, it shows you the cores that they're kind of separate from each other and they don't really talk to each other with the high power computing people program ways that they could talk to each other. So you could even run uh, not quite independent tasks on them. Um, so how I did this in R was um, I used the for each package and the do parallel package. Um, and the for each package, um, if you're not familiar with it, it runs pretty much like a for loop in R if you use it with the do operator except uh, your output would probably get produced. We'll get back to you as a list. But um, the for each loop has the capability to use the do par uh, operator, which um, allows each like iteration of the loop to um, use a different core. But you have to tell it how many clusters or how many cores or workers you want to use, and then you have to register them. So um, from then on, my job was very easy. I would just put all of my parameters into separate vectors and then um, call them right before I call my main simulation program. And um, then if you use a do parallel package, it's a good idea to stop your cluster so that so that your memory gets cleared. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And thank you for listening.